night four. Can we get started? Yeah. Um, good night, everyone. Welcome to Cubay Mentor Series Talk. First of all, I wanted to thank all of my Cubay colleagues for making this happen. Uh, Dan, Brian, Yanlu, Yichen, and Tian Yi, without your help, none of this would happen. Uh, before everything, let's welcome Dan, our Director of Marketing and BD, to give a brief introduction about Cubay. Dan, uh, floor is yours. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Michael. And hello, everyone. This is Dan. It's a great pleasure to virtually see everyone through Zoom this evening. And hi, Dr. Armart. Thank you very much for accepting this inv invitation to our QB Mentor Series. So today we will have about 50 participants to join us. Most of them are entrepreneurs, VCs, and industry partners in our community. I believe everyone is excited like me to learn more about WISE Institute and the Accelerator. And we will provide about 25 minutes in the Q&A section for everyone to give the introduction about yourself or your company or your product. Then we can build up the connections. So first of all, I'd like to give a very simple uh, introduction about QB Center. So Cubay was founded in the heart of Silicon Valley in 2018. I was very fortunate to be the first local member in the founding team. Now I'm leading the marketing and business development in the North America. So we cater for innovation and entrepreneurship vertical. Our business model provides the uh, workspace, life space, technology cooperation, business services, and startup incubation. So we have about uh, we have more than thirty companies who have joined us since we put Cubay Silicon Valley site into operation in the end of 2019. Most of the companies are public companies from Asia, local startups, and service partners. And uh, al almost uh, uh, I think seven percent of the companies focus on the biotech industry. So earlier this year, we also built up our Boston Center in the East Coast. Michael is leading our business cooperation in Boston. I'm very glad he is the moderator as well as the bridge between Cubay and Wise Institute. As Michael is also an alumni from Harvard University, he got his PhD in pharmaceutical in 2014. So besides Silicon and uh, Boston, we also began the pro process of setting up innovation centers in other countries like Israel, Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore, and Mexico. And in the near future, we will also landing, uh, launching our Europe centers. So every company in Cubic platform will access re the resources in our global platform. Uh, and last October, we also launched our first Startup Accelerator Program. This program aims to help the uh, precision medicine startups scale efficiently and effectively in the global market. This page summarized the data in this accelerator program, which I will not talk about too many details tonight. Uh, today, we also have several founders who joined this program uh, last year like Tan from CJNX and Janice from N1 Life. So we can have some more communications later. And in the near future, we, have, we, we hope we can have the opportunity to work with Wise Accelerator to provide more resources for the startups to have the healthy and sustainable development. Uh, okay, that's, that's much about so what I'm going to say tonight. And I hope everyone can enjoy this evening with us. Thank you. Thanks, Dan, uh, for the introduction. Uh, tonight, uh, we have uh, Rashi Ahmad from Harvard uh, West Institute, a uh, West Diagnostic Accelerator. Uh, it's focusing on en enabling the fast creation of uh, diagnostic technologies to solve high value clinical problems, deep collaborations driven by OMAD uh, diagnostic needs. Uh, Rashi is going to cover that in detail. Um, Dr. Rashi, Ahmad got his uh, bachelor degree from uh, Bayes College um, and PhD um, from, 
and, and Brown University and postdoc training in Boston University and MIT. Uh, he worked in uh, Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard for 12 years before he started to serve as the head of Harvard uh, with Diagnostic Accelerator. Uh, today, Rashid is going to give an uh, introduction about uh, WIS Diagnostic Accelerator of Harvard and uh, the, the industrial uh, participant programs. Uh, Rashid, it's a floor is yours. Great, thank you, Michael, uh, for that kind introduction and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, it's nice to be here with you this evening. So I will uh, spend about 20, 25 minutes at most um, uh, talking to you. First, I'll briefly um, expound on what Michael said, a little bit of my background and what like, all of us need some passion that drives us. So, and this will tie into the story of why now I'm at the VIS Institute heading up the VIS Diagnostics Accelerator. So my background uh, is in physics. I'm a physics, ex-physics physicist, you know, from long time ago. Uh, and what I did there was um, I call myself a neutrino hunter. So we, we look for um, neutrinos, which are fundamental particles, and to figure out if they have mass or not. Now, this is purely esoteric, meaning that the end goal there is publication and for physicists getting the Nobel Prize. So that was our mission. You know, as a physicist, that's, that's what you dream of. And that's what I trained myself on for many years. Uh, and in fact, um, my advisor and director um, of the program, Art McDonald, did get the Nobel Prize for our discovery in 2015. Um, so that was a big accomplishment, but I left physics right after my PhD in 2000. And one of the reasons is because given my ethnic background of being from Bangladesh, um, I always had a feeling of um, real urge to give back to society. Uh, and that's where the translation part comes in. And now, as I said, in, as a physicist, our goal is, you know, um, uncovering new truths about this world uh, and very little translation directly involved if it's novel physics that we're working on. So I switched and then I went into software industry because as a physicist, you learn lots of different technologies, become an engineer of all types. And I was a software engineer also. So I switched to software engineering and did that for four years. And then I wanted to come back to science and did so in, in biomedical science. And that's how I came to Boston Medical as a postdoc. That was in 2004. And one thing I'll mention that I almost joined George Church, you know, the famous George Church, who's a geneticist at Harvard University, his lab as a postdoc. And I'm telling this story because some of you, you know, it will all relate, come, come together in the end. Uh, he had a postdoc, uh, he said, Drushti, George Church doesn't have time to teach an ex-physicist how to pipette because I had never done, you know, any type of biomedical research. I was a physicist. So I uh, right. he joined. So he, uh, so it was Martin. He said, come, come with me to Boston Medical and we will set up a proteomics lab. So this is mass spectrometry using mass spectrometry based clinical proteomics to do biomarker discovery in various biofluids for all types of diseases. And that's how I got into from physics to software engineering into biomarker discovery and diagnostics. And the passion that was driving me was translation and giving back and doing something in public health. So that's, that's how I got involved. And so after two years of working on blood-based biomarker discovery um, in lung cancer and COPD, this was in the early days of proteomics. Um, and I did that for two years and then moved over to the Broad Institute in 2006, and I was there for 2012, 18, doing a lot more mass spec-based work. Again, biomarker discovery, diagnostics in all types of diseases. So cancer, of course, oncology, you know, and neurological diseases, and in particular, infectious disease. And that's where I started working on tuberculosis, TB. And what I did was set up various clinics around the world, uh, you know, setting up labs with clinicians on the ground to collect blood samples to do molecular epidemiology. And so this was in 2006, and this was a Gates funded, Gates Foundation funded project. It was called the Grand Challenge in Global Health. We got about, you know, many millions of dollars to do this. And that's how the journey of biomarker discovery in infectious disease started. 
And what we were able to do is for the first time show that there was a host response in blood for TB, tuberculosis infection. And now I've been to China at least five, six times talking at various TB infectious disease symposiums about biomarkers and uh, TB diagnosis because as you know, TB is a big burden in the world, especially in India and China. It, it, uh, more than 50% of the TB burden is over there. So I've been there many times and uh, talked to many clinicians in China and, and trying to figure out how to come up with the final blood-based diagnosis. Now, how, does the, how is this all relevant to the VIS Diagnostics Accelerator? Well, during that time, I had collaborated with Dr. David Walt. Now, that's an important name because he is the scientific founder of Illumina, right? So, you know, Illumina, he, he founded that with five others, I believe, and he was at Tufts University. So when I started collaborating with him when I was at the Broad Institute in 2015, it was to take the biomarkers that we had discovered in blood. These are five markers in blood, host response markers. For example, IL-6 is one of them. It's all published and I can share them with you at another time, the publication, is to take those markers and come up with the point of care device, the small you know, microfluidics device that from a drop of blood, in fact, you know, Elizabeth Holmes' trial is just starting, you know, what she talked about, you know, from a drop of blood with Theranos. When we heard about that a long time ago, we thought that doesn't make any sense. It's never gonna happen. And of course it was all fraud, but what we are really interested in is true from a drop of blood, we can diagnose a lot of the diseases. And our hypothesis is that there are signatures in blood of all types of disease. You just have to be able to find it and then be able to measure it, you know, specifically and sensitively. So that's how the collaboration with uh, David started because he presented his new technology called SIMOA, Single Molecule Array, which is digital ELISA. So it's hundred, a thousand times more sensitive than your standard ELISA to do protein concentration measurements. And that had a path forward to a blood-based small format point of care device. So you can have biomarkers for any disease, but if you don't have the final device, the assay and the device that can be translated uh, to the field, then the biomarkers are pretty much useless. You know, it cannot go anywhere, it's just a publication. So what David and I were talking about was output, not output oriented science, but outcome, translation oriented science. So here the story now comes full circle and the VIS Institute. So David then moved to um, Harvard University and Brigham and Women Hospital in Boston. Um, and he is now the core faculty member of the VIS Institute. And he started this concept of the VIS Diagnostics Accelerator in late 2019. And, and so when I left the Broad Institute in 2018, because I wanted to work on translation, I started my own company. I decided to join up with David Walt again at the VIS Institute and head up this VIS Diagnostics Accelerator. And the drive behind it again was outcome translation oriented science. Now a little bit about the VIS Institute. So the VIS Institute is, was founded some 10 years ago from a generous philanthropic grant from Hans Jörg Viss. So he is a Swiss philanthropist billionaire who gave about half a billion dollars over those 10 years to start the VIS Institute. And Don Ingber, a uh, Harvard faculty, he's the founding director of the VIS Institute. And the VIS Institute has a lot of core faculty members. So I mentioned George Church is a core faculty member of the VIS. Jim Collins, who you may have heard of, is also a core faculty member. And then David Walt and there are others, uh, also core faculty members. What the VIS Institute is passionate about is translation. So all these faculties uh, at Harvard, they're working on all types of basic research, either in therapeutics, vaccines, or diagnostics. So they are heavily involved in that. And what the VIS Institute does is help translate it in this academic uh, way. Hi, Rashi. Uh, do you want to change to your own slides? Yes, I'm going to share. Yeah, let me just go to that now. Yeah. 
So what the VIST Institute does is all about translation and the VIST uh, diagnostic. Do you mind go full screen? The, yep. Full screen. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Can you see now? Yeah. Okay. So the, the mission of the VIST Institute is all about translation and the VIST Diagnostics Accelerator, the concept, the mission is to have the unmet clinical needs in diagnostics, pull the innovation. Meaning instead of basic researchers and engineers and scientists coming up with cool technologies, for example, to measure and analyze as sensitively as possible, right? Coming up with a solution and then looking for a problem to solve. So we do that a lot and I've done that myself as a basic researcher, but what we want to do is have the clinical needs pull that innovation and that is much more efficient. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind it. And now in order to do this, there are many stakeholders that are involved. And what I'm calling it the three Ds, you know, discovery, development, and delivery. And so the discovery part is, you know, you have an idea. Uh, you know, take that idea to develop it and then to deliver it, many stakeholders are needed. And then we also want to measure the impact so that we can learn from our uh, mistakes or our successes so that we can be more efficient in delivering. Now, what we have done concretely at the VIS Institute is set up a collaboration with Brigham and Women Hospital that just got signed. And what that um, means... Yeah. Uh, hi, hi Rashi. I think yeah. you, your slides are not moving. Oh, no, I'm still on this slide. So here I'm going to talk about... Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, do you mind to go full screen? So it's easier... The, 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 the I'm, on, I'm on full screen. You don't see? I don't. Uh, we don't see full screen. Um, and plus, we don't see it moving. Uh, do you mind to move a little bit so we can see that changing? Okay, can you? Uh, no, it's not changing. It's not moving. It's not moving. It's not? Okay. It's not. Um, how about this? Maybe redo that again. Is that moving? No. No? No, it's not moving. Okay, let Maybe me. You, yes, stop sharing and do that again. Do you see that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you mind to move that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's better now. It's full screen, okay. Okay, so, um, so all these different stakeholders, for example, um, what we have now set up is a collaboration with Brigham and Women Hospital, which means that there are thousands of physicians, clinicians, nurses within the Brigham and Women Hospital, which is one of the you know, most famous hospitals in the United States, right? And, and set up in Boston, so is Mass General Hospital. Uh, that and Dana Farber and Children's Hospital, so they're all in the neighborhood of the VIS Institute. So with this collaboration, what we can do now is engage the clinicians and physicians at Brigham and Women, who are on the front line managing treating patients, to get the unmet needs. So doctor, you know, such and such will say, well, we have an unmet need in say pancreatic cancer. This particular diagnostic needs to be developed. Right. So we are now building a catalog of unmet diagnostic needs that are coming from the front line from patient from the patients and the physicians and then what we do is use that to engage right now within the vis institute researchers who would want to partner with the clinician or physician and come up with the solution so that's that's one thing that we have set up one hospital but our goal is much broader and you can almost think of it as a center. And now accelerator, I should say that in the business world, accelerator means you know like an incubator, like a Y combinator. We are not an accelerator in that sense. Our the accelerator here means that accelerating the process of getting an idea in discovery through development, through delivery. And what we want to create is this this consortium, this playground uh, of all these different stakeholders that come together. For example the regulators, FDA, payers, uh, various NGOs, all the different biobanks and grantors and hospitals and patient advocacy groups come together to solve common problems in delivering diagnostics. So that's 
uh, you can think of it as a center for diagnostics innovation. So we're in the process of building out this bigger initiative and the VIS Diagnostic Accelerator will be one component of it. And what you see in the bottom is this industrial participant program, which I'll also mention, which is another component. So let me go to the next slide and show you what this Brigham VIS Diagnostic Accelerator is. So we have Brigham and Women Clinicians, as you can see, this has launched. It's now uh, has been publicized. Uh, so we get that unmet diagnostic needs. We have VIS Institute engineers uh, work with the clinicians. And you could also imagine that industrial participants that are partners with us in IPP could be part of this you know, process where they get access, and we have to figure out exactly what that means, to all these unmet diagnostic needs where they can work directly with key opinion leaders, uh, can work directly with the clinicians and physicians so that they can purposefully come up with that diagnostic that's really has a market need and a patient need and a clinician need. So that's what we want to be more efficient about. And once the team comes together, a clinician and a technologist, it goes through an advisory board. We have a clinical advisory board. Once it's approved, then it moves through our pipeline and having a CLIA lab, meaning Brigham and Women involved, a hospital, we can then validate it with clinical patients, do clinical trials within our system. So you can see the whole pipeline from discovery all the way through clinical validation happens within this system. And then we have already de-risked it. And if there's potential, then it can go out, spin out and become a company in itself. So that, that's the idea. And another way to look at it is uh, in this diagram where we have the unmet diagnostic needs, feeds into the discovery process, developing it, then delivering it and measuring the impact. And there's also a lot of analytics and on the right hand side, you can see all the different opportunities that there can be of our partners who are working with us. You know, of course, networking opportunities, access to various subject matter experts, investors, they'll all come under this umbrella, um, access to biospecimen, uh, access to potential clinical trial partners, and of course, marketing and having industry influence. And when I say access, I have to be very mindful and careful because we are after all, a nonprofit charitable organization, that's Harvard University, right? So when I say access, there is no special access. Everyone has access, but if you become a participant with this IPP, for example, then you can sit on the front row and it's not extra privilege or anything, but there is you know, a better access, let's put it that way. Um, now, one of the goals now, IPP, let me now talk with IPP and then I'll finish and then we can go into discussions. Uh, so the industrial participant program is launching uh, in less than two weeks, September 13th with 16 inaugural member companies. And I'm happy to say that two companies from Cubay, in fact, uh, Cygenix, Michael, as you know them, and with Tanvir, Tan, and Ageless AI, uh, with Anthony, uh, they are members, inaugural members of IPP. So uh, that, that was uh, very nice to see them come out of, you know, with, with QBay has already, you know, uh, helped them along, right, Michael? <laughs> they're, 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 they're such cutie pies. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're yes. for them. <laughs> right. So they are uh, inaugural members of uh, this IPP program, and it's a pilot program. Now, I should mention what it is it's a paid membership program. Now, since it's a pilot program and nothing like this exists within the Harvard ecosystem, so we had to be very careful in coming up with the agreement. And it's a membership program. Now, something like this exists within the MIT. Uh, it's called ILP, Industrial Liaison Program. They also have the MIT Media Lab. And their you know, companies pay hundreds and thousands of dollars for you know, various benefits. Now, what we are doing is a pilot program and it's focused just on diagnostics. And that's what IPP is. And the fees are $10,000 for this early, you know, adopter or inaugural members, which we've now closed the book, meaning we have our 16 companies. But if, if any of you are interested, we can definitely discuss that offline or even here about if you're interested in, in, in joining, uh, we could maybe have another round, but we are launching in uh in less than two weeks um 
So I'll just jump to potential benefits. I, I write potential here because we cannot say these are the benefits because this is a pilot program and it's you know small amount of fees and the fees you can think of as almost like going to a conference you know in that way it's almost like a gift uh, allowing us to manage various workshops where these 16 companies will work with us to come up with a framework uh, so that when we go to year two ITT 2.0 and we open it up to the universe of companies to join us for various fee structures, say it's $50,000. What is the benefit? Why would a company pay even $5 to join? So we have to make the case, we have to come up with the framework for it. What, what, what are the benefits for the companies? What are the benefits for the VIS Institute, Harvard University and other members? Um, so we are going to be defining that in this pilot phase with IPP and all these 16 companies including the two from Cubay, you know, Ageless AI and Cygenics are going to work with us to come up with those. And in the meantime, there are going to be benefits, for example, you know, access, not in a privileged way, but access to sitting in the front row and learning about what the VIS Institute is doing, you know, learning about all the different potential clinical needs that are out there in our community and engaging with us and networking. So that is what IPP is all about. Uh, and there are, of, of course, potential benefits on the Harvard side, and you can read here for yourself. Uh, but uh, our goal is to make this successful and go into year two. So I will stop here, Michael, if that's uh, uh, good enough of an introduction and description of what the VIS Institute, VIS Diagnostic Accelerator and the IPP is, and then we can have a discussion. Uh, thanks, Rashi. That's a really nice talk. Right now, we have a general idea about um, what we're doing and uh, what, 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 what the WIS Diagnostic Accelerator is uh, helping us. And uh, uh, right now, it's a Q&A session. If you have any question from any, uh, any of you, you can just simply unmute yourself and ask uh, the questions. Um, yeah, are there any questions? I want to, yeah, if, if you also uh, have, if you have any question, you can also use the chat box. Um, then I can probably read that for you. Uh, I actually have a question for the company members. Right now we have 12, right? For the accelerator program currently. So how long are, are, are we trying to incubate them for? For one year, for half a year? And so the number, what's the, the size of the accelerator program? So are we doing, uh, like below 20 or is there any limit for the numbers thanks oh uh, sorry i it cut out could you just repeat that again sorry michael i couldn't yeah uh, my, my my question is like uh, firstly i just wanted to ask how many companies are in the in this program i heard it's 12 16 but 16 yeah 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 16 so is there any um up limit for the numbers um like what is the schedule for for the enrollment right so so for the pilot phase we wanted to keep it around 15 because and we're calling it pilot very purposefully so that we can prove it out right so if you have too many companies you know then uh, it could be potentially problematic you know too many voices and but we're open to it if there's a good fit uh so few days ago, I just talked to a company that is doing animal diagnostics in animal health. Now we are all about now, right now, human health, but that, yeah. but the diagnostics accelerator or the, say the center for diagnostics innovation, when I've talked about it, it's anything that diagnoses anything. So anything under the sun, right? So of course, animals, the environment, which I haven't even talked about. So. We are, we are potentially interested in maybe having them join us, although we are you know, full, but so we can have a discussion. So there is no upper limit. We just said 15, mm -hmm. 16, so now okay. 17. Yeah, so we are obviously interested in talking to anyone who is interested in joining. How long is the whole process, the whole accelerator program? One year or two years is the program? Is there any um, estimation for the time? Oh.
Hi, 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 Rashi. Is it me or him? Is it me? Hi, hi, guys. Can you hear me? Can you give me yes, a feedback? We can oh, hear you. We, we, can, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, it's Rushdie. Hi, Rushdie. You probably. Seems he, he got an issue about the internet. Yeah, you got an issue. As, yeah. Um, as Michael, we have communicated with some founders in QA community, and I saw them here in the participants. So I think we can invite them to give a brief introduction about themselves. Uh, I'll suggest from Justin. Justin, out there. Yes, hi, I'm here. <laughs> hi, Justin. Hello, Dan. Um, yeah, let's hi, just I... wait for Rashi. Let's just wait, uh, wait, wait, wait for him. I think he will get back on right away. Um, I think we can start the introduction and waiting for Rashi in the meanwhile. Is that okay? Hey, I could go ahead. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Anthony Moos, and uh, as Dr. Rushdie mentioned, um, we've been selected for this uh, brand new inaugural uh, program called the IPP. Um, we're honored and uh, extremely happy, and a little about myself and uh, Ageless AI and what we do. Uh, we're in, also in the biomarker space, and uh, when I had my conversation with Dr. Rushdie uh, earlier this uh, summer, uh, we, we hit a keynote and found a lot of synergy um, uh, in terms of the biomarkers and the clinical translational space. And um, I've done quite a bit of research between uh, Stanford University and UC Berkeley. And uh, one thing that never sat well in my stomach is that there's amazing things happening at top tier universities, but never gets introduced to the real world. <laughs> and when I was working with this medical translational group, at Donner Lab at UC Berkeley, we were we were working on visual biomarkers uh, for movement disorders. So, essentially, my company, uh, Ageless AI, uh, we're we're out here to improve the quality of life for people uh, suffering from movement from movement disorders like Parkinson's. So, uh, I'm Anthony Moose, and uh, happy to be here, and appreciate it. Yeah, nice to meet you, Anthony. And I think we've met many times in the building. Anthony is also the member company at QBay. Thank you, Anthony, for your introduction. So next, let, uh, let's have Justin to introduce his company, Facebook. Sure, yeah, sure. Justin, go ahead. Yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Justin. Um, like uh, Dan introduced, uh, we're one of the companies that's uh, a member company at QBay as well uh, in San Jose. Uh, the name of the company is Basic Global. Uh, we are a high-tech company dedicated in providing big data and uh, AI solutions uh, in, in the... Uh, the global way it's uh, as a technology uh, in the form of a uh, SaaS uh, data platform. The privacy computing basically um, is a technology that enables multiple parties to be able to process, explore, and collaborate uh, on data. At the same time, it's full uh, data privacy protection and access control, right? So for example, if any of you wants to have the need to host like large scale of data, any kind of data, clinical data, genomic data, and if you want to share such data with your partners and uh, don't want to worry about privacy and security of the data, um, you're welcome to uh, reach out to us and we can definitely uh, discuss solutions. Thank you. That's on uh, EMR or claims data or genomics data, any focus? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we handle all of those data you just mentioned. Okay. Okay, thank you, Justin. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, if you guys want to have the meetings with Justin, we can also schedule it at QB anytime. Thank you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you, Justin. Um, mm -hmm. Next, let's have um, Ken. Ken, are you there? Who's there? Yes, I'm, okay. I'm driving, so that's why you're not seeing my image. Otherwise, you would see it. Uh, you know, oh, be careful, by... man. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, Rushdie, Dan, and Michael. Uh, Michael and Dan for selecting Cygenics as their part of their inaugural 
Precision Health Accelerator, which was started last year, but unfortunately we got uh, hit with COVID uh, lockdown, so we weren't able to use the kind offer they gave us of uh, free space for six, six months or so. But now we're taking up on that offer and hopefully both Michael and Dan will connect us to the ecosystem of China and Asia as both in investors as well as potential customers and partners. Uh, my company, Cygenix, is aiming to solve a very, very unique, uh, simple uh, problem, which is that clinical genetic testing, especially when you involve a fewer samples and a fewer genes, actually takes a very long time. Even though we've heard of this, uh, you know, this genome for under six hundred dollars, or even some companies are looking to do it for hundred dollars, but to actually do a sequence of, for example, an APO4EK gene, which is, which has some indication linked to dementia, the cost can be as much as $6,000 and it can take 11 weeks to actually have it sequenced and analyzed and interpretation delivered to the clinician. So our aim is to enable clinicians to do tests on site in their labs, uh, in their hospitals, in their medical centers and have the results within a few hours. And uh, one of the reasons why we're joining IPP is we, uh, apart from George Church, David Walt being faculty members at, at uh, the WIS, we look at the opportunities to actually perhaps co-develop some IP together with the researchers in Harvard as well as WIS, which you know we would have world-class uh, access to world-class talent researchers and experts. And also having this link also gives you a certain amount of kudos when you're trying to sell uh, your product to developing countries and even developing uh, developed countries, and also when raising money. Thanks, Jan. I'm back. Sorry, I had power outage. <laughs> the wrong time. No problem. No problem. So, Rusty, before you disappeared, I had one question. What are the opportunities offered by WIS and the Harvard ecosystem to co-develop IP and access to experts and talent? Uh, yes, um, th there's always that opportunity and there's a process for all of that. Um, now, as you can imagine, if you're not part of a system, it's hard to, who do you go and talk to about that, right? That's what I mean by getting a front row seat and having the opportunity to have those discussions. So all of those are absolutely possible, uh, but there's a process for it. And we all have to be mindful that it's, again, it's a nonprofit charitable organizations and, and you know, and, it, and we, we just have to follow the process, but yes. Thank Does you. That, yeah. And we are in fact excited about this opportunity to, uh, you know, partner with, uh, we're calling participants again, I should mention that the Office of General Counsel at Harvard, you know, is very particular about the words that we use. So initially we wanted to call it industrial partnership program, but partnership has a strong connotation, their legal meaning. So now it's an industrial participant program. So I just want to be very transparent and clear about all of this uh, because when you are dealing nonprofit, dealing with for-profit companies, which is perfectly fine and it happens all the time, there is always, always these processes. So we, we just have to approach it in a mindful way. Um, yeah, Rashi, uh, 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 before you log back, we were just given an introduction for some of the startups who is interested in this program, or so some of them are already in the program. So we probably wanted to finish the introduction. Uh, Dan, how many we have still? Yeah, so uh, during your absence, uh, Rashdi, we have Justin Tao from Basebit International uh, that introduced uh, his company. And Justin is a founder uh, at QBay. And he, he is running a very well-funded company. Both have the branches in US and China. Uh, so Justin, would you like to say hi to Rashdi again? Yeah, hi, of course. Hi, Rashdi. Hi there. Hi, Justin. Hi. Very, very nice to meet you. Um, very, very, very uh, inspiring program you just mentioned. I, I'm actually really, really interested in the IPP program. And the reason for that, just allow me to repeat myself. I'm sorry, everybody. Um, but the technology we, we, we provide is called privacy computing. 
which is basically allow multiple parties to uh, share data without sharing the data itself. They basically share the data by doing, uh, doing collaborations, by, by doing computations, but without revealing the data. So um, I, I think it could be valuable to a program like IPP, where um, if you have multiple parties that are trying to uh, do collaborations, that we have a lot of data, sensitive data, especially in the field of medical and healthcare, um, uh, technology like privacy computing may, may, be, may be useful. So that's, you know, just kind of like from, from hearing what you just said, I think that's, that's, that's a very interesting uh, thing uh, you're working on. So I was just wondering if there's any, any way for us to maybe uh, find the time to discuss more about possible no, uh, way to, to collaborate. Uh, no, absolutely. So any technology that um, makes the whole discovery, development, delivery of diagnostics more efficient, you know, whatever that is, can mm -hmm. be plugged in to a this pipeline. And uh, right. so absolutely, right. yeah. And uh, through Michael and Tanvir has been very busy making lots of introductions. And I'm always, mm -hmm. as Tanvir can say, and also Anthony, that happy to always uh, connect and talk. Uh, there's, there's absolutely no harm in networking and, and learning about each other. That's the first step. Great, great. Yeah, thank you so much. I'll, I'll try to reach out to you. Thank you. And that goes for everyone else in this forum. Please feel to reach out and I'll find the time to talk to you and see you know, how we may collaborate now, if not possible later. Again, it's the whole networking part is uh, so important. So it's actually related to uh, Justin's question. So what if the company is not diagnostic related? For example, uh, Justin's company is uh, data security related. So is the program still welcome um, those companies that is not directly related to diagnostic, but indirectly? Uh, yes, as I said, anything indirectly, directly that helps the process of getting diagnostics out, right? So what I showed that big matrix, if you remember all the different stakeholders, right, that are going to be coming in and they have to collaborate, right? And there's going to be data that is, has to be shared. Um, so underneath it is a big software engine, which I didn't even get into. How do you make it scalable and efficient? Um, because our world is really the whole universe of unmet clinical needs, different diagnostic companies, different types of companies around the world that we want to bring a, on board. That's the really the global vision is anyone who thinks of diagnostics thinks of the VIS Diagnostics Accelerator or the VIS Center for Diagnostics Innovation. So that's what we want to create. That, that playground, that framework where everyone can come together. And, and in fact, Justin's company is gonna, could I can see playing an important role because you have to provide the security of sharing confidential information, you know, across right. different, different parties, across different geographies. So yeah, I, I can definitely envision that. Yeah, I think we still have a couple of companies to, for the introduction, right, Dan? Hello, uh, any company who wants to give an introduction? Uh, yeah, uh, Michael, so we've invited um, Frank Hu from Santian. So Santian is a startup at Hubei. They joined us by the end of 2019. They have closed their Series A and have a very good uh, funding team. So yeah, Frank, yeah, you can hey. introduce yourself and your company directly. Uh, thanks Sam, for introducing me to do the um, introduction. I'm with Sandia for three years. I'm not with I'm not a founder, but uh, um, just a uh, very small company. So what we're doing is uh, basically, um, you know, providing the uh, bioinformatics software to analyze genomic data. Because uh, right now there are you know people working on sequencing, working working on genomic data, but to process them it's a big challenge. They are pinpoint. Um, so current solution is to rely on the open source tools that's being developed by the uh, like the research universities, but those tools are not engineered, typically not, not engineered pretty very, very well. So what we're doing is provide the robust, the fast, accurate tools that typically can accelerate the, the speed for like 10 times than the open source tools for our, for our users to, to accelerate their analysis. This can be thing, 
regarded as a foundation of your, you know, the utilities if you want to do any genomics or transmonomics related analysis. So in the very beginning step, you need to process your raw data. So that, that's what our tools shines really. So right now we, we are, we, we've been established for several years and right now we have over 300 um, global customers uh, and uh, over like two, 200 citations worldwide. Um, but we'll still continue to develop more tools uh, for the whole, whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. So yeah, I also noticed that uh, we also have a VC friend, Vincent Xiang is here today. So Vincent was the partner at uh, Hill House Capital Group. He is um, establishing his own funding recently and this funding will be, uh, 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 this will be focused on the life science industry. So Vincent, are you there? Would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, it's very nice to participate in this great event to know all those uh, new friends. Um, yeah, I think uh, 7G BioVenture is a new fund, even though I come from, you know, years of the background in terms of uh, investing in the private and public company. I was a PM at the uh, Franklin Templeton Investment as well, uh, focused on life science uh, uh, investment. Um, but I would love to, you know, uh, learn more about you know, the incubators at the both program, the WISE as well as the QQ Bay. I think I have the luxury to uh, had a very brief tour uh, by uh, Dan just about a month ago, but I haven't got a chance to really learn about some of your uh, incubator companies, but uh, I think uh, time will connect us and then uh, there'll be uh, many opportunities for us to learn each other from each other. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you. So who's interested to give a... Give yeah, if there, if there anyone who is interested in the giving section about your company and have a discussion about it, or have any questions for uh, Rashi, please go ahead and tell me yourself and speak up. Thanks. Yeah. All right. I am Sharina Rice. I am a tech entrepreneur, scientist, and I'm working with Ageless AI, as well as a handful of other companies. I'm wondering, when it comes to diagnostics, what is considered a diagnostic? Like, where is the line drawn between predictive analytics and just diagnostics of a thing? And does it have to be something that is in living organisms? Um, no, great question. So the way I've been talking about it is uh, extremely broad. <laughs> So uh, climate change, you know, there's uh, anything that environmental detection, right? So it doesn't have to be living organisms. It doesn't have to be just human health related. Um, and in terms of predictive bioanalytics, we have a group called Predictive Bioanalytics a platform within the VIS Institute. But if you recall the matrix that I showed, the discovery part, there's a discovery engine where there's going to be a lot of predictive bioanalytics employed to come up with the biomarkers using machine learning algorithms. That's what I use to come up with the biomarkers for TB diagnosis. In fact, the TB markers that we came up with, there are five of them, and they feed into a machine learning algorithm, and that then gives us uh, the diagnosis of you have TB or not. So uh, in terms of, yeah, the definition of diagnostics, extremely broad anything that helps the human race and the planet, you know, survive pretty much. Great. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. thank you. Um, I think there's a question from the audience is asking, I mean, from the chat box is asking for um, the success criteria, uh, criteria. Uh, why, um, I mean, what uh, was Diagnostic Accelerator program is for? Um, is trying to achieve uh, ultimately numbers yeah. of spin out partnership or patents. So I think he is asking for um, what this program is for. Right. So the VIS Diagnostics Accelerator and the VIS Institute in itself, the way we I like to measure success is by the number of lives helped and saved. You know, the very broadest of 
success metric. So, for example, I talked about output oriented science versus outcome. We're interested in outcome translation, right? So output could be we measure success by the number of papers published, okay? Now, in applied biology, for me, papers are a means to an end, which is, has it gone out to the field? So it has to be a patent. Has it been patented? Has, a, has it been licensed? Have companies been formed? And not just formation of companies, okay, it can make a lot of people a lot of money, but has it really helped lives? Has it really gone out and saved patients and, and help, help physicians manage their patients? So that's how we are going to measure success. In fact, impact measurement is going to be a key criteria. And one thing that I can send you all, I'll send it to Michael, is the VIS Institute impact report for last year. And over there, what it's shown is over the last 10 years, 44 or so companies have either been spun out or patents have been licensed to 44 over the last 10 years. Um, and now what we're trying to do is follow up with all of them and see how successful they've been. So that's one way of measuring it from the VIS Institute. So for the accelerator, it's part of the same, same goals. But the key metric is, uh, and it's a hard one to measure, life saved you know, disease, disease burden reduced. Thanks, that's very clear. Um, I just see Brett is also here, Brett Niles. Brett, you wanted to give an introduction? Yeah, hi there. Uh, Brad Niles, uh, CEO of Arise Precision Medicine. Uh, we're developing uh, uh, lung cancer therapeutics as well as a couple other uh, cancer types. Uh, going after a uh, family of genes and proteins that are uh, histone methyltransferase. Uh, so we like to think uh, that our therapeutics uh, will be uh, with a, a um, companion diagnostic product uh, that would diagnose the patients who would uh, you know, have the disruption in the particular gene that we're going after uh, and then have a, a therapeutic designed specifically to treat those patients. No, that's, that's great to hear, Brad. And in fact, combination diagnostics, uh, companion diagnostics uh, is also, you know, part of our mission. So not just, uh, so we will be working with, you know, pharma um, and uh, as we grow. So that's definitely, you know, uh, in our pipeline. Excellent. Good. Thanks so much. Are there any other questions? I think I may have cut oh. out again. I'm back. So the so so another question is uh, a lot of the participants are uh, companies, right? So um, is the all program also yeah, all of them are. Startups companies. So how startup is not just startup. There's pre-revenue and um, startups and also mid-sized companies. Yeah. Okay, startup to mid-sized companies. Yeah. But what is um, is there any criteria for investors getting in this program? How you're connecting with the investors? So right. So the IPP, so Industrial Participant Program. The I also stands for Investor Participant Program. And that would be, you know, something that we're also interested in. And in our matrix, as you saw, funding is a key component. <laughs> you know, you need money to do the work. So yeah. it has to come from somewhere, uh, either, you know, grants or, you know, through uh, foundations or, in, or VCs. Uh, and we have engaged a number of them. And we're in discussions of how, and I talked to you also, Michael, you know, about how, how does that work exactly so that's the that will be uh, something that we will be exploring to figure out exactly what the benefits are uh, so for example right now ipp is in companies and smaller companies but we've also talked to the large companies diagnostic companies like the roche beckman coulter and others and uh, they would be interested in acquisition targets for example so that's how they may come in, uh, but not right now. So these are things that we will be working out over this pilot pilot phase. Yeah, that would be nice if we have a platform for the big pharma, for example, Roach, and also the 
Yeah. Um, investors from from the healthcare industry can join us, and there's a platform we can we can do that uh, together. It would be nice. Uh, yes, and that's something that we could have a discussion with with Cube, right? And you know, start a pilot investor participant program, and 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 figure out the way we did the industrial participant program is engaging. We interviewed lots of companies to come up with a formula for, you know, why would they pay the $10,000 even to join, you know? So, uh, because it has to be funded in, in some mechanism. So we could have start having those discussions with other investors and VCs. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's why we're here for. Yeah. Okay, so Michael, it seems we, will, we only have one minute to the end of this event. Uh, so for the last opportunity to, to talk, so how about Alex, Alex Zhang? So Alex is running a local life science incubator in South San Francisco. And he was also the chairman of a local life science organization named CABS. Um, so Alex, are you there? Yes, hi, hi, thank, uh, thank you, thank you for, the, for the introduction. Yeah, and uh, so I'm Alex Zhang and uh, uh, I'm a managing director uh, of a new uh, biotech incubator uh, based in South San Francisco, we we'll see uh, the uh, at the heart of the uh, biotech innovation uh, in the Bay Area. So uh, uh, we are uh, thirty percent of our incubators and will be in uh, medical device and uh, diag uh, diagnostics. Uh, Seventy percent are in therapeutics, and so uh, we're very glad to uh, uh, to uh, get to know the uh, uh, Wise Incubator, and uh, I think the uh, the uh, uh, our uh, uh, the startups uh, in the uh, diagnostic fields, and they will have a lot of uh, 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 resources to share uh, with the uh, our counterparts and friends and uh, uh, on East Coast. And uh, uh, also, uh, well, as the uh, we are a brand new uh, incubator, and so uh, we're officially going to open uh, uh, in about four to six weeks, and we're still renovating. Uh, our new facility, and uh, so uh, 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 please expect uh, our uh, marketing material and uh, pretty soon, and uh, so I think in the next few weeks, and I uh, welcome like uh, everybody and here in the Bay Area uh, to come to our site and uh, to pay us a visit, and uh, so we also uh, accepting uh, applications and uh, for our uh, for our new uh, incubator, and uh, thank you very much. Yeah, Thanks. thank you, Alex. And Alex uh, is also one of our advisor for our startup accelerator program for 2020. Thank you very much, Alex, for your big support. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate all the support from our partners in the Bay Area. And we hope to build up a joint program in the future to support all the life science startups in our network. Okay. Mm -hmm. so yes, yes, we look forward to it. Okay, um, since our time is up, uh, so uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you, Rashi, for, for coming today to share a great experience uh, for us. And uh, a little bit of introduction for our next event is going to be on uh, September 29th. So it's going to be in San Jose, it's a physical, it's, it's a physical uh, cocktail party on uh, um, investment on uh, pharmaceutical and medical devices. Uh, so it's a connection with the uh, um, uh, investors. So you 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 guys are welcome to be there physically, and also I'll I'll probably send you guys an invitation. Um, let's hope uh, Delta is not the party pooper. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone. I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have thank a good you, night. Everyone. See you thank next you. time. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care. That, oh my God, that's...